So thank you very much, John. I appreciate the invitation. And uh, Carl Maticola at the University of Kentucky actually contacted me and said, you know, I'd really like to come to Tampa in February from Kentucky, but he just has too many things to do. So he said, well, here, will you just you go talk to the group out, out at Tampa Bay Downs uh, on the 27th? And I said, sure, no problem. Glad to do it. So some of you, you know, I know that probably maybe an experienced group in here. I'm just going to talk a little bit about just the general things about concussion that okay. you've probably okay. have heard a little bit about, maybe not, maybe not in some cases. Knowing that talking with Carl that there's a you know it's, this is you know, newer ground for many tracks and, and what you guys are starting to do related to that and I appreciate John talking about all the fancy stuff on there but I'm just a tour guide so <laughs> however you, you know wherever you guys want to say ask me about this go ahead uh, during the talk and try to get you out here and I know it's after lunch so if you're starting to feel that little snooze you know we might take a stretch break in the second you know have you stand up for a second. Okay, first thing though I'm gonna have you guys do, okay, just so we're everybody's aware, okay, is go ahead and let's see, yeah. So this way, okay, so with your right hand, touch the person next to you on their left on their on their right shoulder. So with your right hand, with your right hand, the person next to you, to your left, excuse me, to your left. Or left, sorry, to your left with their right, okay. So what we just did is got you guys to cross midline, okay? And that's an, an awareness and alertness thing, okay? The teacher geeks, you know, we figured that out somewhere. That helps you go, you know, sort of re reorient a little bit, okay? So we're going to talk about sport-related concussion a little bit. You know, one of the things nowadays is all about disclosures, okay? None to declare, but I will entertain offers. Okay? So, you know, that kind of thing. So some of the things that, that Carl actually sent me when we talk about concussion, there's all kinds of symptoms and, and head trauma, you know, but this is what some of the stuff he sent me is that the direct losses, you know, the jockey can't work, right? Success of the mount, the rehab cost, disruption, family life, disruption of the stable, lots of consequences to this head trauma, okay? And there you go, there we are, right? That's one of the tracks that has been involved in this. The other thing is, right, you guys know this better than I do, right? The jockeys ride a big animal, okay? 1,500 pounds in the helmet at 30 to 40 miles per hour. So I was looking at this stuff, I'm going like, wow, that's something else where if they have a fall off of that mm -hmm. in a race, you know, some of the catastrophic, right? So catastrophic consequences. So you think, you know, we think about the typical things that they're gonna have a fall during a race or during a training, right? And you're thinking about, you know, as we do, whether we're dealing with lacrosse players at the university, football, you know, any kinds of, kind of things like that, or we're thinking about neck injury. Now we might have a potential spinal cord injury, all right? Those are rare in most places, right? Don't happen all the time, okay? But then we also have, typically, a lot of times they have head trauma as well, okay? particularly if you're on a big animal going at that kind of speed. And that, you know, and I think we have a great example in NASCAR, right? That just happened yesterday. Dale Earnhardt Jr. just came back from eight months of rehabilitation after his concussion. You know, there was questions whether he would return at all. So understanding that that takes a can take a long time and the consequences of, of head trauma and a concussion cannot be that, and even if you think that the trauma is very little, there are some athletes and some, you know, that will have, could take months to fully recover and meet the standards that you all have to return to rock. Okay. So, just quickly talk about what is a concussion, okay? And I'm gonna have some fancy definitions, okay, and some different things, but out there in the, in the world, they call it mild traumatic brain injury. Okay, or MTBI. Okay, in our athletic training, I go a lot of times. A lot of us grew up play around sports. Often, your bell rung. Right. I don't know if that's a term in racing. Is that a term? You got your bell rung and you fell. Whatever you got your bell rung. If anybody played football in high school, might have remember that. You got your bell rung. Go back out there, Johnny. 
Okay. Now the NATA position statement talks about that, and that you should not use that term. That the ding, the bell rung, is a really poor term. Okay. <laughs> and it doesn't really tell you anything, and it makes it you know, and they talk about it's a minimizing kind of terminology. Okay. So if you look at sort of some of the things that the international group, and right now uh, the, the standards are from what's called the Zurich meeting, okay, where a whole bunch of experts got together in Zurich, a hey, nice place to get together, right? Okay, spent a few days talking about, well, what are things we can all agree on internationally? All right, and they really looked at things about related to consciousness and what happens, and that most of the concussions that we deal with most places are relatively minimal, and then there's this coma scale that's often used in emergency medicine about level of consciousness. So when they look at where do sport-related concussions typically fall, for mo in most cases, is in that minimal to mild, which is, hey, they're usually awake. They have some level of disturbance of their neurofunction, but they're usually awake, okay? And they're aroused, they, they can talk to them a little bit. So the Zurich standards really talked about concussion is a brain injury, okay? And all those fancy stuff, right, that incorporates, so it's clinical, right? And very much of it is clinical management. There's, you know, we're working on things that can deal with things like the pathology. You're gonna hear things now that will be great for the track, great for sports in general, is that they're gonna have blood tests on the sidelines, probably in the next few years, okay? So you could have race track side, a blood test and a marker for concussion, like that. Yeah. That'd be really cool, I'm sure, to help you all manage, you know, return to sport, return, you know, should we, can they rock or not right now? Even though, right, I bet you most jockeys are gonna say, oh, I'm fine, mm -hmm. right? I'm fine, I can get back on, okay? They're looking like that, but they're fine, I can get back on that horse, no problem. You know, and then, they, then when they get up and they're facing the wrong way, you know there's a problem, <laughs> right? Okay, so there's lots of stuff out there, some really cool stuff coming. Okay, but right now the Zurich standards, which are actually about five years old, you know, they just met in the group, this consensus group just met in Berlin back in November. So we'll see the next round of what are the sort of the changes, the standards of management, prevention, those kinds of things. So direct blow to the head, right? But you think about it in um, sports, and I've been at work a little bit at a time with rodeo. So, uh, you know, thinking about guys on bareback, bronc riding, bull riding, you know, this kind of thing, the whiplash effect <coughs> in riding as well <coughs> can cause that. So, can be things that you don't think, well, it's not a blow to the head, but they had a whiplash kind of mechanism, okay? <coughs> it's usually short-lived, but sometimes the symptoms can be minutes, hours, days, weeks. <coughs> So still a little bit more talking about the Zurich guys, right? And it's functional, and in some cases, what they call post-concussive symptoms. And that's really what the big thing is, is that do they have these symptoms like Dale Earnhardt Jr. did four months after the concussion? And that they start to get him going, right? And you know, he had a return to, return to racing protocol. And he wasn't cleared you know, until in, in late December, and actually had to do a race, had to get on the track and get in the car and go at Darlington, you know, for a fairly long period of time in order before them to decide, the docs to decide, yes, you can go back to racing. Okay. So, you know, is concussion a problem? Probably, these are just some data from the CDC, if you uh, update a little bit, you know, 300,000 sport-related concussions, we don't really know. Really, the CDC actually just has gotten their budget request for this year for to the to the uh, Congress that they want to establish a national concussion sport concussion database because we really don't know all the way from youth sports and all the things right Friday night tykes you guys might remember that <coughs> my professional association fought against got that pulled off pulled off right but 822 a day occur getting that but what they think, right? And that's probably a little bit higher now that the reporting is higher, okay? What we dealt with at the University of Tampa and around a lot of the college and high school settings is that where are all these concussions coming from? Well, guess what? A lot of them are probably already there. 
they just won't report it and find and discover it. Okay. And then just some data in football, 497 deaths, 343 were brain injury related. You know, we're not heat illness, we're not cardiac death. Those kind of things. High school has the greatest risk from us from the organized sport. Riding, right? Racing, you guys have a high, you know, are high risk. When you look at a lot of the data, we have an equestrian team at the University of Tampa, and we looked at the equestrian data, uh, and they're probably one of the highest risk sports. They're a club sport, so unfortunately they're not covered by our university athletic training division, because as club sports, they're independent of, of the athletics, but talking with our folks, they're probably the guys that need, the, need to be screened as well, when thinking about that. So just to talk a little bit about evaluation and what, what sort of the standards are. Some of you guys, I, I know I just talked to Diana that you know, they're doing the SCAT testing, uh, which is a concussion, sideline concussion assessment tool, okay? Essentially what you, you look at the standards, okay? Sort of international standards are, is that evaluated by a physician or other licensed healthcare professional using a standard emergency management principles, right? Rule out, hey, do they need to go to the ER right away? Are they, or is this an urgent in the, or an emergency? Is it urgent or can it wait and see? And that they actually say if there's no healthcare provider available, safely removed from practice, right, or play with an urgent referral to a physician arranged. So some things to, to watch, that we watch for at the university that we recommend, you know, in your, in your tracks to watch for with the jockeys. Symptoms, is there headache, cognitive, physical signs, behavior changes, okay, cognitive impairment, sleep disturbance, okay? I don't know enough about the travel schedule of jockeys. Do they, I mean, traveling from track to track? Yeah, you know, with sleep, sleep issues, sleep, dis I mean, sleep in general, right? As a society, we got problems, but sleep disturbance is a critical thing to look for post concussion in particular, okay? And that good sleep is, okay, is necessary for recovery, okay? So the, the SCAT-3 is what's the standard right now because it came out of the Zurich, which is the third international consent, or is the third bit revision of that, the, out of that. And it's a four-page thing. It looks really scary when you look at this darn thing, okay? And of course, there's not an app yet for that, right? For the SCAT-2, there was an app, okay? For this one, there's not, okay? I'm sure that somebody somewhere should be was working on one right now. Okay, so what should what do we do at the university? What's recommended nationally to do? Like if you're talking trackside assessment, you've got a jockey who fell, right? You're concerned about a head injury, or you're concerned about it, right? the first thing is emergency management, right? More serious stuff, right? Do they do using this? The Glasgow Coma Scale is one of the things they recommend, right? Potential signs of concussion. <coughs> did they have a loss of consciousness? How long is their balance, right? And coordination, loss of memory, those kinds of things, right? Before or after, the injury, <coughs> right? Have you guys, and who's seen a jockey with that sort of blank look, vacant look? It's like the thousand mile <laughs> stare or whatever. It's like, no, no, I mean, maybe that's every day. I don't know. You know, is it, is it more blank than usual? You know? Okay. And that's and that's really the critical thing is the folk you guys who are close to the jockey who see them every day, right? When they're at your track and you're looking at that. Now, hey, is there something different about them? You know, yeah, they had a little bit of a fall yesterday, whatever, or you know, maybe they told you about something that happened outside of the track <coughs> where they had a head injury, you know, suspected head injury, something like that. Okay. And then we look at those kinds of things. The good thing is most people on the Glasgow Coma Scale are used to pretty functional, you know, some disturbances. They're not, hey, I can't, they can't open their eyes, that kind of thing. But emergency management's gotta be first. And that's what we look at is those kinds of things. Some of the things, one of the, one of the things I like is this, it's pretty simple, right? And it's really, if they get one, if they don't know one of them, okay? Now you have to know your jockeys, of course, like you guys would, and to say, do they know where they are, right? Would most jockeys in a normal state know what track they're in? I hope so. Right? Okay. You know, now half is not, you have to figure out what would be the right translation to, for you guys in, in the racing life, right? As far as what half, you know, because this was developed for soccer primarily, 
right? Which half? So I guess I don't know. Would you say what race is it? Right. Yeah. You know, something like that. Where that would be that you know, you know, we used to ask all kinds of crazy things that you know, wow, I may not know that. What day of the week is it? I don't know. You know, I'm not concussed. I hope. But, okay. You know, who scored or would they, would they pay attention to who won the last race? Sometimes. Sometimes or is there something you know? You kind of just in these kind of things, I think you'd have to adapt them to what would be appropriate for the track. What horse they were riding. You know, what horse they were riding, should they know that? You hope so, right? Again, you hope they know what horse they're riding. You know, did your team or did your horse, right, win their last race, whatever, you know, whatever, something like that. So it may, you know, but these are just things to say, maybe you need, maybe in, in racing, you need to take a different, you know, maybe think about, about those questions that would be appropriate for that and say just a yes or no. And I like it because there's only five questions. You know, so that way it's a screening tool to say, hmm, there's something not so good here. And that's what we do in the emergency. Yeah. So that's really emergency stuff. You know, so we're doing that right up front after we see the injury, the incident happen. Then it comes down later on the, you know, when you get them out of that emergency situation and at the university when we get them to the sideline or we take them into our athletic training clinic. Then we ask them about all of these symptoms and we score that. You know, headache, pressure in their head, those kinds of things. Um, that kind of thing. You know, do they get worse with physical activity? Right? Because some people have symptoms anyway, and it's not unusual, right? Even at baseline, it's not unusual for people to have headache when you screen them at, at, at the front end. Okay? But does it get worse with physical activity? Does it get worse with mental activity? <coughs> Those are the kinds of things to watch out for when it comes to symptoms, okay? So if you're at the track, right, or like us, we're on the sideline, for example, right? We address the first eight issues, right? Then sort of look at those symptoms. We don't leave, we try not to leave them alone, okay? Try not to leave them alone, right? And then should not be allowed to return to play, right? So if you think about it from your case, right, they can't ride again today. Uh, I don't know. So help me understand racing, right? Do they, do they typically ride just once in a, yeah. on race day, or they're multiple, times. right? So if they have that, if they have this happen mm -hmm. in the first race they're riding, mm -hmm. right? The national international recommendation is, and you th and they have a suspected concussion, they don't race the rest of the day. Then they're pissed off, <coughs> right? Yeah. right? And they're throwing stuff and whatever, and that helmet goes like that. <laughs> Right? Okay. And then the stuff Carl sent me, I was reading about the helmet, right? As soon as that happens, then they got to get a new helmet, right? That the jockey helmet, right, is really only good for about one fall or one blow, which is really kind of interesting compared to what we go through in like football helmet testing and hockey helmet testing. And Diana, you guys have a jockey right now that's for that because the stick, the testing, you know, what's going on. So, sure somebody out there is addressing that for you all I hope uh, with that you know and then practice right their practice days same thing you I think they have a fall early sorry you're done for the day okay and you're gonna get evaluated okay imaging imaging I mean it's always a question right and in elite sport right I brought my brain with me thank goodness <laughs> so I can talk sound intelligent to y'all right um, but if you image a brain, the standard stuff, right, and we, and it still happens, right, is that, say, a jockey gets hurt, they get referred, they take them to the hospital, or they're going into urgent care or someplace, hey, we're going to do an x-ray. X-ray is only going to know if they got a skull fracture or not. <coughs> not really going to tell them much, okay? And then a CT or an MRI, the standard, in most concussions, right, they're really only good if you suspect that they've got a bleed. They have a brain bleed. Okay. So if it's a typical concussion, there's no damage that you can see on the standard CT or the MRI. It's not till they get to some of the fancier imaging, right? But the typical things that they do in the emergency room are not going to show that, which is why they talk about because of the nature of concussion, right? And the stretching that goes on, you don't see that that damage, right? If you suspect that they're, hey, they started out here at their level and they're going downhill, right? Their physical symptoms, they're going downhill, then you might suspect a bleed and then a CT or an MRI might be important. But we encounter that in 
at our university athletics is that some places will go, the, the ER will automatically do a CT or an MRI, and it's negative. It's even more prevalent in the high school situation. It's negative and they go, oh, you don't have a concussion. You know, because some ER physician isn't up to speed on what the evidence is. Okay? Can, can you have a... Yeah. So. so everything looks good means she doesn't have a, a, a clot or a brain leak. Okay. It doesn't mean that she's got underlying any kind of underlying physiological damage or physiological stress in the brain because we know that happens. There's a huge biochemical physiological stress in the brain that has to to rebalance the normal metabolism in the brain is about seven to ten days after the, the concussion. And that's how long it was after the impact. You know, and the thing is the CT the day of or seven days later is gonna probably look the same. Yeah. You know, so in some respects if you look at it from a medical management standpoint, if their symptoms are sort of stable and are getting better, there's really not a need because then it becomes unnecessary cost and time for the jockey, for the track, for the guild, all that. You know, hey, that's that's MRIs aren't cheap. <coughs> They're not going to tell you much of anything, right? So that means working locally track with people who are up to speed on that and knowing, hey, do they know what to do if we send them over to St. Joseph's Hospital down here on uh, MLK, right? Or you know, if we send them to Shan's Hospital in Jackson or someplace, you know, do, do they know what, are they up to speed on that data? And that happens knowing that, hey, we don't need to have a standard CT unless we suspect that they have bleeding in the brain. Does that make sense? So most imaging, you know, we don't get imaging on probably very few, maybe two or two a year at the university, two athletes here where we're concerned or there's something like, hey, something's just still not right, let's just get one. And then they get one with contrast and all kinds of funky stuff. Let the doctors worry about that. Okay. What we do, however, is do balance testing, postural stability. So we'll get them on, right? At the university, we have this fancy thing here called Biodex, but you don't need that. You can just do it some on site at the track balance testing as well. This gives it a little more objective. We've got data to compare it to, give them a normal, sort of normal ranges but you can look at what, what can you do to check balance, right? Because you've got all those memory and all those things that they tell you, but then you can get some little bit more things as postural stability, right? There are some things now, right now, we, I just mentioned about genetic testing and some markers, right? <coughs> and some what they call biomarkers, where that Abbott Laboratories actually is working on one with a little pin, with a little finger prick, drop of blood, see what's, see what's there, levels of proteins. Right now, it's still in development. Okay, a bunch of those kinds of things. Okay, probably the big thing is neuropsychological assessment. So, if you guys have heard of the impact <coughs> test, I don't know if you guys have heard of the impact test. Okay, which is one of the, one of the multiple systems that are out there. So it's a computerized testing. Okay, that's typically better to have a baseline test followed by you know post injury if you have it, but if you don't. Doing kinds of drills like that where, oh, hey, what's the shapes? How many X's? How many the O's? What colors was that design play? It looks at reaction time, some of those kinds of things, right? It's an important component. However, we don't recommend and typically don't recommend using it as the sole basis, right? Oh, your impact is below baseline. Plus, there's lots of issues. Do you think a jockey would try to cheat on something like that? They're taking a computer test and it's reaction time. Uh, Oh, oh yeah, okay, right? So we had that problem at the university, you know? It's like, oh, if I'm really slow on purpose, then if I do have a concussion, I, I might still be faster. So I might actually have be a better score after I have a concussion. So we know that, and there's, wait, there's actually tools they use to say, yeah, you kind of cheated on that one a little bit. So there are indications. All right, so management, which you guys are, thinking about it. the cool thing is about concussion recovery the majority recover in a fairly short period of time seven to ten days however in children and adolescents we do see that it can take longer 
and I suspect there's youth riding at a lot of the tracks, right? Some of the think programs, right, to develop, you know, that and equestrian was is a uh, event with youth. So if you're dealing with youth riders, that may take longer than the typical seven to ten days because of just their they're they're growing, right? They're changing more rapidly. Okay. Now the corn probably the two cornerstones to think about physical rest. So no training, playing, riding, all that kind of stuff, weights, whatever that the jockeys may be doing. And then cognitive rest. This is starting to be a little bit controversial because some people are saying, well, look, maybe we don't need to rest them as long. Okay? We don't need to rest them as long, begin to do things a little bit more quickly. You know, as always, the pendulum swings like we did too much rest. Now we're probably you know, coming back to maybe what the research geeks might say, okay, about the right kind of rest. But we do sort of have that standard, some cognitive rest. Okay? So television, reading, video games, texting, you know, social media stuff. None of your jockeys do any of that, right? Don't text no. anybody. No. Then none of them post on social media anything. You know, how about how wonderful the track is? Over. Okay, that kind of stuff. I think about our athletes, you know, like texting, you know, computer. You know, because your brain needs some recovery, needs some recovery time. Because it's souped up, it's metabolism of the brain is souped up. Afterwards, so it's going to need some recovery. If you just keep adding more and more things to it, by what you're doing, right? Although you don't always want them to sleep during the daytime, you want them to get into a normal sleep pattern, whatever is you know fairly normal for them. You know, thinking about the schedule of the track, <coughs> the racing. You know, what sort of a, what would be a normal sleep pattern for them, as opposed to sleep out of that normal cycle, you know, as well. So, what should we expect? for most concussions, right? Is a gradual resolution within seven to 10 days. What we should expect, right? That the symptoms come back, the mem if any memory issues come back, that come back, okay? Their balance things, their computer testing, if you do that, all of those should sort of level off in about a week or so, okay? Gradual return to activities, that does not result in significant Exacerbating symptoms, proceed through stepwise return to sport, return to play, return to ride kinds of things. So this is the kind of protocol that we use that's from the Zurich protocol and some other places that maybe you guys may already have at some of your tracks where you start with no activity, right? They're, they're recovered at that point, then you do some light aerobic exercise, right? whatever that is, walking, biking, swimming, in, right? less than about 70% of their max effort, max heart rate kind of thing, you know. No resistance training because that elevates their blood pressure more than light aerobics, okay, to increase their heart rate. Now the thing is here is that it's 24 hours per step and that you, ever, at each, the completion of each step, they, to go to the next one, they have to be symptom free, okay, does that make sense? Is that, so it's, a stepwise, so you think about it, it's about a six to about a seven day process, right? <clears throat> okay? But if you, they get symptoms at day three, then you drop back, you have to wait again, right? And then you try to go back to it. So it's gradual return to riding, return to play, return to sport, however you want to phrase that, right? And then you'd have to apply that, you, have, you know, that's something that I think, you know, the experts in your area have to say, well, what's appropriate for you know, well, can they just ride a little bit? You know, I guess it would be, you know, pace of the horse, right? Or are they just going to be out for a well, walk on the history, horse? What type of sport you guys will be talking about? You know, horse racing. Okay. Do they have a previous history of concussion? Prior <laughs> head, face, jaw injuries, non-sporting head injuries. You know, type of player. Are they real physical? I, you know, I don't know if that's a Thing about how you know what type of jockey they are, ability to take a hit, okay, kind of thing. Protective equipment. How old is the helmet? Right, those kind of things. And it, during their pre-participation physical, it's an opportunity to educate lots of folks. All right, educate the jockeys, educate the ownership, the trainers, all those kinds of folks. Right. So, subjective history, medical history, and then what's recommended typically nationally, internationally, now across the, the game is that you should, at the beginning, at baseline, beginning of the season, 
right, preseason, balance testing, and then some kind of neuropsychological assessment. You know, I'm just showing you what we use. We use this thing, we have this device at the university, and we use this computer system. Okay, the high schools in the area here in Tampa, right, do some balance testing, but not usually with this thing. The, they, a lot of them, with working with some of the clinics, do this, do the computer testing as part of their baseline and then return to play. So think about it's knowledge transfer, right? Is educating. Educating your colleagues, educating the jockeys, right? <coughs> educating the track ownership. These are some things, right? Be aware of signs and symptoms, fair play and respect, okay? And the experts actually said, what role can we have for web-based resources, for social media, to get knowledge out, knowledge transfer, because a lot of, you know, in our world, in, in the college athletics, those kids are all about social media, so how can we get the knowledge out? Because it's, we know, we know in our place, kids under-report concussion, right? So in, I know in your world, right, because there's money, big money on the line in many places, right, they're gonna under-report their symptoms, okay? But it's, Thing. Are there ways we can get them to why they shouldn't? You know, there's lots of people, right? The Department of Defense and uh, has got a you know multi-million dollar grant program going on right now with uh, the NCAA looking at, at this. To how do we deal with this in the military, uh, high schools, colleges, and come up with some things? Uh, let's not. Okay. So what Carl Carl said sent me this picture about the safety, integrity, accredited, all that kind of stuff. I think that's awesome, which, what's going on in horse racing. And when I talked to Carl last year about him getting involved with stuff with, with you all, and that you're beginning this surveillance system, you know, and this is just the picture that he sent me that, you know, like, hey, that's really cool that you've got, you know, a accreditation, safety and integrity <coughs> accreditation process for the tracks, and that you're developing this database of injury. So my closing thoughts for y'all would be communication has got to be critical among the local players, right, among the local tracks, but what you all are developing as far as communication between the tracks across the country, you know, because what Carl told me is like a lot of times it was like disjointed, right, and you didn't know what happened at this track and the jockey shows up at the next track. And as I was thinking about this, I'm going like, you know, rodeo. <coughs> has a, anybody familiar with Rodeo? They have what's called the Justin Sports Medicine Program, where basically they, they, in that circuit, they had hired athletic trainers to travel, pull the sports medicine trailer to the different rodeo events. And then they had local athletic trainers and physicians that they would partner with to help staff the events at Rodeo. So I'm going like, you know, that'd be kind of a cool thing, maybe in thoroughbred racing, track, you know, your, your area. I'm like, wow, what if they had a, you know, you need the boot dealer or somebody, right? You know, that was invested in that. But communication, so they were, so they actually, a lot of those guys knew the same players, right? Because the, the circuit's kind of the same, right? They're going to certain tracks, certain races. Hey, do we have people that we ca can consistently work with in Tampa, you know, in Louisville, in Santa, in Santa Anita, that we can have as our resources? in those areas and developing those resources so it's like hey i saw you last year let's check you out you know how you been doing you know, and then you've got that communication at the track level or at the guild level somewhere where they can we can know that right okay carl and i talked about that so better integration of the math medical aspects because you have jockeys that travel from track to track right horses and all that the travel adopting the international standards so what's coming next is Berlin 2016. So that's gonna be what's the next changes to look out for, right? And to make sure that whoever's standing up here with a medical hat on is talking to you about not 2013, but 2017 stuff, okay? Yeah. Baseline testing program. That's probably the biggest thing that has come through. And that was hard for us in the college setting when the NCAA said, universities, you have to implement a concussion management program. That starts from baseline and education, All right? So we have a video. The video I was showing here at the very beginning that some of you may have seen 
Right. That's a video, and it's been updated, that we show our athletes they have to watch and have to sign a form that they have watched it and they understand. They also sign an acknowledgement, a specific concussion acknowledgement statement that they understand that they are their, it's their responsibility to report symptoms of a concussion. Okay. Now, do they? Probably not. But at least they have informed understanding right, at baseline. And then the testing program, whatever you think you can implement, you know, and identifying partners in the communities where your tracks are to say, hey, is there people who can come out, we can do balance testing, right? Can we get, you know, a therapy clinic that's, you know, got, does a lot with concussions, athletic training programs in a, uni in a university setting somewhere. You know, who do we have there we can develop or we got people who can come out and help us, you know, run these 50 jockeys or how many of you have at a track at a time, run them through a baseline program at the beginning of the racing season. You know, if that's doable or what kind of timing you can do, right? And then, as Carl and I talked about, making sure that you, you're getting a return to ride criteria, right? What, are, what do they have to be able to show you, right? Show the medical team, show the track before they can get back on a horse in a, you know, in a competition, in a race, those kind of things, right? Or return to, you know, full go practice, right? Without medical supervision on a daily basis. So that's my talk. Um, so if there's anything I can answer for you, and just so you know, that that's not Tampa. <laughs> okay? Yeah. You might think it is, but it's not. That's actually off the south coast of Australia. Oh, wow. So I was there a few years ago. I said, that's an awesome picture. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've got several questions. Awesome. sensitive to electrolyte uh, fluctuations and blood glucose you know because your brain you know is you know a fairly small percentage of your body but it uses 20 percent of your blood glucose okay so I mean it's a high energy demand so if they're depleted you know, which is why I'm, and actually I thought a little bit about this it's like realizing jockeys have you know, their weight they have to make weight in wrestling, what they did is they actually went again as part of preseason and to say, okay, you're going to have a you know, safe weight loss program, and they actually have what's called a minimum weight certification process um, that, especially in high school, is saying like you can. In other words, for wrestling, they say you can't go below a certain weight right? because when I worked with wrestling in college, you know, we'd have kids who were naturally 165 pounds. And the coach would say, I need him to cut to 134. And then, and then if, you, and if the jockeys are like the wrestlers, so they cut weight so they can make it, so they can get on the horse, and then they go like that, right? That week. Okay. They got to get down. But probably you have to think about how do they get there, you know? And is their electrolyte balance okay for that weight? Right? And maybe there is some body composition assessment that you can like, well, you know, really, you, you know, they shouldn't be that, or how, or can they get there safely and then stay there? That's the thing. You know, we saw in wrestling, a lot of sports, they go up and down like this. You know, you know and they'll cut down to 134, go up to wrestle at 142. One guy would eat like a whole bag of Oreo cookies. Hey, I made weight. You know? <laughs> That's kind of thing. So I think that's the thing. That you would think, yes, there should be some relationship there. Could be because it was, uh, if 
potential impact on blood glucose and electrolyte imbalance. Second question. Is there a relationship between concussion headaches and concussion headaches? Yes. I didn't know Julie from. Uh, there seems to be oh, some. I mean, so I mean, it's this correlation, not causation. And then, and then we just sort of keep up. Uh, but yes, and then, but you can also say, seems like you need to know, do they have migraines before? Yes. Do they develop long-term symptoms? Does that impact then their risk of concussions? Or what were concussion-like symptoms? Might want to get So we're not really sure. So there is some correlation of data that says, you know, hey, you're messed your brain chemistry. And at some point, you know, we're getting to the point now, how many concussions is too many? Right? That's the discussion across all of sport, uh, sports in, in general. And my third question is not directly headed to but also back to spinal injury. Um, from having been... I sent you the NSA. I saw. Oh, I didn't look at the... Yeah, 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 yeah. I got the thing. Yeah. 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 So we send that video to every physician who's going to be the attending yeah. physician of the races. And they perform the test. Okay, well, here's the, here's the interesting things that are going on in emergency medicine. And they, they is, fail. Right now, they're talking they're about... And they have to come uh, no back to the NSA office for the impact test. So, like, if you've got a jockey down on the track, right, right, and, you're just, right and it's, you're treating it as a suspected mm -hmm. neck injury, spinal cord injury, because they were unconscious when they got here, all that kind of stuff. It's, we're talking about now, and, it, and it's flying in the face of what I learned. Right. Now we're just talking about not even not even neutral stabilization, but just in, in keeping them in position. That they found maintaining their airway right, until EMS gets there. They're right now they're talking about not even really doing a, putting a collar on. Maintain that sort of central position, right, and get them on the gurney. Not even put them on the spine board. So the EMS people are really going over here. It's like, well, because what happens is in a lot of situations is you get right, the patient gets to the ER on the spine board, and the ER is busy, you know, because all things always seem to happen on Saturday night or Friday night, and they're laying on the spine board for three hours, and now you've got issues of pressure and other injuries from the spine board. So we're having that happen in our high schools and colleges where the EMS protocol is, well, there's no collar anymore. We just kind of maintain it. You know, if they've got the shoulder pads and helmet on, you know, some places are saying, we don't have the skills at the ER how to do that. You've got to take them off at the field. You know, we're not going to put a collar on them. We're, we're not going to put them on a board. Or if, or if they're on a board, we'll take them off once we get them on the spine, once we get them on the gurney. So I think that's where you have to start dealing with what's going on in the local EMS or state EMS protocols. And because really, most of the time, right, even the collar doesn't prevent some of the issues that they see and some of the studies they've done. But we're really struggling with that, how to teach our students, what to do when we've been taught for so long, stabilize, central stabilization, you know, turn them like this, do all this, get a collar in. Well, the standards in the EMS land are going the other way because of the other issues they've seen with that and, and the fact that most of the time they're not dealing with a jockey on the track or a high school football player. They, they're dealing with the wreck on I-4 you know, or the wreck on the Crosstown Expressway this morning. That means I got through there before the car was up on like that. So I think you know that becomes work. The track has to work with what's the protocols with the EMS in, and what can you be comfortable with? Who are your first responders? You know, and, and the other thing is most time, you know, in our sports world, we don't do it enough to do it well. So, you know, I can talk to athletic trainers all over Tampa Bay and say, well, yeah, we know how to. We we don't have a spine board because we don't do it very often. We don't do it enough to do it well. You know, so unless your team at the track is practiced enough with that, then you basically say, all right, we're going to keep this jockey in position. They've got an air, you know, we know how to deal with airway management, you know, AED, all that kind of stuff, CPR. You know, hey, we'll, we'll assume that if they need to get turned over, they'd rather be alive and quadriplegic than dead. 
You know, I hate to say that, but that's what I tell our students. You know, right? You know, what if they're not reading and they're laying face down? Because you know, all of our scenarios are always face up. You know, hey, jockey fell and they're face up on the track, right? Let's put them face down with their neck like that. That kind of thing. So I think you really have to say, well, what are we going to be comfortable with doing? And as long as they're stable and breathing, you know, and we're, we're going to wait for EMS to get here and let the people who do it every day. So I think you just have to say, what is, what's the protocol there? Because you know, what you may happen is it tracks here and may say, this is you know, an EMS, local EMS protocol might be this. And we are going to put a collar on. But a lot of places now, the EMS is changing so fast that you know, we're having struggling keeping up with. And, and, and it's really weird because like you look at what Red Cross and American Heart and like basic life support, what they're teaching, and some of their things are completely different if it's for healthcare professionals versus the lay public. Yeah. And even within levels of healthcare professional, it's really weird, it's different. We are just talking about that at the university. It's like, well, this one talks about, you know, just maintaining them as found, whereas this one talks about, okay, manual, you know, put them, put them in neutral kind of thing. Does that help? Well, somewhere in there, that long-winded answer. Academics, we get all excited about that. Okay. Anything else? Yes, sir. When your kids come, how many, you're going back to the baseline. Yep. Do your kids get a baseline every year or just their freshman year? Uh, minimum freshman year or, or their first time at the university. So, like, we have kids that transfer from other places. So, the first time they could, even if they had one before, if this is their first time in our system, then they get the baseline stuff, you know? So that, and then, now the impact people will say the impact is only good for two years. You know, if you look in their clinical manuals and stuff like that, the impact should be redone every two years. We talked with our doctors and they said, eh, you know, that's a lot of extra work. You know, we think we're okay with the baseline as a fresh, freshman, 18 year old, <laughs> You know, but still knowing brain's developing. <coughs> so in our place, if we can, if we can put a baseline for every jockey that comes into the track, mm -hmm. we would not necessarily have to redo it. No, I mean, if you think, you know, unless you, unless you're, you would say, okay, they've had a, you know, if they've had a concussion, and then you retest them, and at whatever point they're cleared, you know, all the things are clear, then that can become their new baseline. For follow up around the track, you know the cool thing, like a lot of this, the, the the computer systems are, um, we like Impact because there's a there's an app that they call the Passport app, which basically, as long as the jockey or somebody has the their pass, what they call passport number, that means any anybody who's got that app, any doc or any system who's got that app on their phone, right? Whether it's in Tampa and then if you go to Louisville. As long as you have that impact passport number, you can type that in with your into your account, and you can pull up the baseline that they did here in Tampa and check them. And, then, and I think on the passport app, there's the symptom checklist is on there too. <coughs> so you can actually get access to that. Or if the jockey guild says, "Look, we're just going to buy a, buy a package license from Impact or Cogsport or one of the vendors," and say and all these tracks are gonna have access to that data. You know, so that way you have, have that. But the cool thing is, I like was the app that, and I tell the athletes, keep this email, because it emails them. Keep this email somewhere on your phone, whatever, because if you ever have a concussion away from the university, <coughs> they can pull up your baseline test on your app. <coughs> yeah. One quick follow-up. How many is too many, and what period of time would you talk about? My favorite answer, it depends. One could be too many. When you look at if they, you know, if they're, if they never get to back to recovered at all, one could be too many. You know, the discussion right now is somewhere between three and five, probably, you know, probably at, at a point if they have two documented concussions in a year, maybe three, then they're, they're done for a, a year. 
Yeah. It becomes a very clinical management. It's like, what do we think is safe for this person? You know, and they're going to have a battery of tests. Yeah. But it's symptom free. You know, they're cleared. Mental health, psychological, physical, no symptoms. You know, and then really saying, what's the risk? You know, in racing. You know, and that comes down to with your injury surveillance and say, well, look, you know, the risk of concussion is X in racing. You know, and that goes back to all that just, you know, monitoring what happens around the country and saying, now we can say, well, the risk of concussion is about one in, you know, 2,000 practice runs. And it's about maybe one in 500 races. Okay? And then it really comes down to, well, you know, you're an adult jockey, okay? But sometimes, it's like our adults at the university, we have to help them make adult decisions and say, you know, that level of risk is just too high. You know, that you've got to think about <coughs> 20 years from now, 40 years from now, right? And we talk, it's your brain, right? This is your brain that you're talking about, you know? And help them make a decision, because sometimes one might be enough. Because my, our, my concern always is, how many did they not tell us about? You know, and we don't have an idea about this. The jockeys probably haven't told you about some of them. And then you go, well, it's documented concussions somewhere between probably two to three, maybe five. It's very, you know, and it comes, what's the risk? To you as a jockey, at this point, at this age, you know, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, the, where we where it's probably more conservative is in the younger is in the adolescent population, you know, because their brain is typically is conservative, conservative their brain higher risk. So if we deal with adolescent riders, you know, it may be they make a decision like, well, sorry, you're not racing, you're not gonna, there's no chance you're getting on a horse in a race or practice run for two years, even after one concussion. I don't know, you know, so that's the the, the non-answer answer. <laughs> you know, it comes down to at your track, what's our policy? You know, with our medical advisors, with the guild, you know, that whole, you know, which is like just like the NFL, you know, what's what do we do? The yeah. difference is your your kids <laughs> yeah. I, I, they may argue with you on this but they're not making their living from this. Right. Oh yeah. Our guys, I, yep. if we if we tell them they're down, mm -hmm. they don't work it. Yep. And it's their living. Very mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the same thing in, in the rodeo circuit. The people I know that work at, it's like if they don't, if they don't ride, I don't eat. You know, so that becomes a, you know, that's a real hard thing. Is that, you know, and if that's all they know is to ride, and then what do you do? Okay, you know, which then I guess that's in, you know, sort of the idea of in the racing association, the jockey guild is like, well, you know, what are we doing for medical insurance, all that kind of stuff, if, they, if they're now disabled, you know, because of concussion, you know, because the, you know, the thing y'all don't want is a lawsuit, you know, a big class action lawsuit like the NCAA had, had to settle for 750 million, okay, you know, people are like, wow, or, you know, the NFL lawsuit, you know, but the good thing is, you know, that don't hide, <laughs> don't, don't hide the data, right? That's what kind of got the NFL in trouble, because they were they basically got caught hiding data okay? and conflicts of interest mm -hmm. among the medical providers um, was a big is a big was a big thing. Yeah. And thinking about how do you, you know, how do you make you know have the competition be fun and be be safe for the for the riders and the horses, right? Profitable for the tracks and the owners, right? I mean, that's what it is. You know, it's all that. It's the balance, okay? And, and which is why you know the NFL has gone with the independent medical observer, the eye in the sky. You, know, you can look at the video, you know, Google the video, eye in the sky, and that's about the independent athletic trainers in in, in the booth up above, looking at, hey, something doesn't look right. You know, in racing, you probably wouldn't have that. 
you know, but they also now have an independent neurologist on the sideline. You know, so that may be one of the things. It's like, okay, they're not they're not employed by the track. They're they're or they're not employed, they're not an employee of the team. They're one that the NFL has, has dealt with as an independent medical because you know, they had a lawsuit and this was their part their agreement uh, to do. Is there questions back there? Or back here? Or were you just waving at me? Uh, no, I was just going to say that uh, I'd encourage everybody to contact their regional field managers. Uh, the guild is in the process or has bought some uh, licenses for the protocols. <coughs> I believe they're actually in the uh, Contact the regional route and find out if you're interested to have them. Yes, sir. It seems to me that we've got things in place to deal with the injury as it occurs. The writer goes on, the yep. guy shows up, looks like he's got a concussion, mm -hmm. he's gone for the day. I'm not sure we're very well covered for the next step. Case yeah. management. Yeah. And there'll obviously be discussions about whose responsibility is it. Is it the track's responsibility to make sure he doesn't get on, or the commissions, the stewards, mm -hmm. the judges? Putting yeah. that aside, is there a guideline or a reference that we could go to that would help us develop policy or procedure? Um, um, uh, you can look at the <coughs> National Athletic Trainers Association um, position statement on con sport related con concussion management. Um, you know, the, you know, it's very sport oriented, of course. But, um, and I think the NCAA. Ha um, sports medicine, concussion management, and a lot of stuff is free online. You know, that's the cool thing. And thinking about what are some of the tools, and then you have to to look at you know some of the other professional sport associations. You know, the, what's the NFL guidance? What are the, what are some of they doing you know, because of that? Because the follow up, you know, in your sport, you know, it's hard. It's going to be harder, you know, because. And, and the thing is, what happens if that happens in the last the last day of racing, right? And this jockey's supposed to go to the next track, okay? And now what? You know. So I think developing that communication plan between tracks and how that how you can how you can do that, you know, with maintaining you know the patient confidentiality of data and who's going to be the contact at the next track, 